Well, wherever you are at the moment, I would invite you to turn in God's word to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to read together from verse 11 through to the end of verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. And then we're going to turn to the book of 1 John and chapter 3. So first of all, reading Paul's words to the Corinthians, chapter 5 and verse 11. Let's hear God's word together. Therefore know that knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Then turning to 1 John and chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, we're continuing in our series today in 1 John. Uh, We've been making our way through this first letter of the Apostle. And we've seen how John is writing with great affection. He's writing as uh, an older man, probably in old age at this time in his life, the last living apostle. And he's writing, we believe, to a group of churches in western Turkey, what is today western Turkey. Churches that have come through a time of difficulty and division because of false teachers. And we've seen, as we've studied this letter, how John has been encouraging them to get back to the truth that he had taught them, that many other people had taught them as well. Uh, He is a father encouraging his children to cling to what is true about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, And that's what we've been finding as we read through the letter. He's also been countering some of that false teaching that they've been hearing. Uh, He's reminded them of the importance of of God's law, of God's commandments. Perhaps one of the things they were hearing was that they no longer needed to worry about God's commandments. But John tells them in chapter 2 that a mark of being a a true believer, a child of God, is that we do uh, love God's word. We love his commandments. We love his law. And he's continued to talk uh, on into the letter about the children of God and the children of the world or the children of the devil, as John describes them. And that is the theme that we pick up again here in chapter 3. So we're going to read together 1 John chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 1 to 10. Let's again hear God's word. John says, chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears... We shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. 
Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. This is God's word. I invite you now to join me as we pray to the Lord together. Our Heavenly Father, we gather together on this your day and we gather together, Lord, in strange circumstances. Uh, perhaps, Father, scattered all across the countryside and perhaps people listening in from all, all different parts of the country or even the world. And Lord, though we are scattered physically, we know that wherever we are, uh, you are there. You, we know that as your psalmist says, there is nowhere we can go. We can't go to the heights of heaven. We can't go to the depths of the earth. We can't go to the far side of the world uh, and not be where you are. You are the everywhere present God. You're also the, all, the all-knowing God. Nothing takes you by surprise. Nothing forces you into a plan B. And so though we find ourselves in strange times, we give thanks and we take comfort from the fact that they are not strange to you. And we do thank you, Lord, that though we are deprived of what we cherish most as your children, uh, to gather together on the Lord's day uh, in this place, we thank you, Lord, that we have means available to us to be able to open up your word, uh, to be able to hear it proclaimed. And we do pray, Lord, that as your word goes out today, as many people do what we are doing and listen in from afar, we pray, Lord God, that your word would accomplish all its purpose. We pray that you'll be with us now as we turn our attention to your word. We ask, Father, that you would still our hearts. We come aside from a very fretful world today. We pray for our world. We pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders. We pray for those on the front lines of the medical uh, profession, uh, the the medical services in our hospitals and elsewhere. Uh, We ask, Lord God, that you would be very gracious and good to our nation Though we are undeserving of it, as a nation we have strayed far from you. We have arrogantly turned our back upon you. And we ask, Lord, that in wrath you would remember mercy. And we pray that there would be a spirit of repentance in our nation even today. And we ask, Lord, that even now you would calm our hearts, that you would take, take away those worries that afflict us today, and that you would give us your peace that surpasses all understanding. Give us the help of your Holy Spirit now, Lord as we pay attention to the word that he has given to us. We ask that you would bless it to us and help us, Lord, uh, to live in light of it and in obedience to it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it'll be helpful for you if you have 1 John chapter 3 open as we come to study it together today. We're looking today in particular at verses 4 to 10. And our theme today is the words that we find In verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared. The reason the Son of God appeared. Some of you in your homes, you may have bookends somewhere on your shelves, maybe on a mantelpiece. Uh, These days, you can find bookends of all shapes and sizes. I did a quick Google search. If you wanted tractor bookends, you could get tractor bookends in all the different uh, types of tractor that there are. If you're a Harry Potter fan, you could get uh, half of the Hogwarts Express on each end of your books uh, as bookends. Uh, of, clo- of course, there's the classic bookends, the big letter A and the big letter Z, and your books are propped up in between the bookends. Something that couldn't stand up by itself, something that ha- would have no staying power, no power of its own, is propped up and dependent upon these two things at either end. Well, the next time you look at books propped up with bookends, I want you to think about your own Christian life. Your Christian life is possible. It is powered by, you are spiritually upright, as it were, because of the two appearances of Jesus Christ in this world. 
his first appearance 2,000 years ago, and his second appearance still to come. Look what John says in chapter 3 and verse 2 of his letter. Chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, his second coming of Christ, we shall be like him. And we thought about those words last time. Uh, you can refer back to the last sermon for, for more in-depth on that. Uh, and we thought about how John there, how he is he's using the, 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 the promised second appearance of Jesus. The fact that we know he will come again. He uses that to motivate us in our Christian lives here and now. Just as any big future event in our lives uh, still to come, it impacts how we live today. And so our lives as Christians are, are looking forward. They're, they're leaning on to that second coming of Jesus, that second bookend of the Christian life. But of course our lives are also hemmed in as Christians, propped up by Jesus' first coming. Jesus' first coming, of course, is what makes the Christian life possible. And John here focuses in on that first appearance of Jesus, his first coming, and all the work that he did in that first coming, and the power of it and the implications of it in this chapter. Uh, really, I believe the key line in our passage today comes at the end of verse 8. The end of verse 8. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. To destroy the works of the devil. And so verse 8 along with verse 5 I believe is the key to unlocking this passage. John talks a lot in this passage about. Uh, some, he, said, he talks a lot in this passage about God's children no longer sinning. Uh, and that raises some important questions in our minds. But before we think about those important questions, we need to think first about the first appearance of Jesus in this world and the significance of it for us. His first coming is like the, a, the, the letter A bookend. And his second coming is like the letter Z bookend at the other side. Our lives are possible because of both. Our Christian lives are possible because of both. So let's think first of all today about Jesus' first coming and what it achieved. And so first of all, today we're thinking about the fact that the Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. The Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. Chapter 3, verse 5. John says, You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Now notice there that once again John uses that phrase, you know. He's used that phrase all throughout his letter. And once again he's strongly emphasizing the word. It's, it's in the perfect tense in the original language. What he's saying is they, they have known, they do know, and they will always know. They're, they've been told something in the past and it has ongoing implications and importance for their life today. You know, John says, that Jesus came into the world to take away sins. John is likely emphasizing this because of the false teachers who had been doing the rounds in his churches. We don't know exactly what they had been teaching, but whatever it was undermined the truth about who Jesus is and what he had accomplished when he came to the earth. And John's saying here, whatever anybody else may be saying, you know, you know the truth. Jesus appeared to take away sins. The word there for take away in the original, it means literally to lift up, to pick up, or even to destroy. And that's what Jesus did on the cross, friends. He himself was lifted up onto the cross physically, and he carried our sins up onto that cross with him spiritually. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, he himself bore our sins on the tree. When we talk about taking something away, it, it, it still has to be dealt with. It has to be put somewhere. Let's say a, a parent uh, takes a, a child, uh, takes a, a toy away from a disobedient child. They put the toy somewhere else. The child no longer has it, but it doesn't disappear into thin air. And likewise, friends, when we speak of Jesus taking away our sins, we're not to think of them disappearing in a puff of smoke. 
He carried them, he carried our sins with him onto the cross where they were subjected to the full and undiluted wrath of God. If you're a Christian, it's not that your sins don't get punished, that your sins don't need to be punished. It's just that someone else took the punishment for you. Jesus took them away from you and onto himself. And of course, he was the only one who could do that. As John says at the end of verse 5, because in him there is no sin. Only someone sin free could offer himself in the place of sinners. But in verse 8, John drives into the heart of Jesus' work even further. Because the fact that Jesus came to take away sin invites a further question. Where did sin come from in the first place? Why, why was it ever even here? Why did Jesus have to come and deal with it? Well, look at verse 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to take away sin. Sin is in this world because of the devil. Therefore, Jesus came to destroy what the devil has done. John says the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And that word at beginning is very important for John. He, he uses it here and there in his letter. He used it at the start of his gospel as well. At the start of his letter here, he describes Jesus as having been from the beginning or in the beginning with God. In other words, Jesus always was God and always a good God. By contrast, since the moment he rebelled against God, the devil has been sinning, wicked, evil. And the devil has made it his life's work to drag human beings down with him. He convinced our first parents, Adam and Eve, not to believe God when he said that sin would result in death, spiritually as well as physically. They believed the lie that they could sin with no consequences and the devil's work ever since is to keep people under his sway as his captives so that in the end we're doomed with him. Misery really does love company. But Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. The word for destroy there literally means to unloose or untie. Jesus has undone the devil's work. Imagine something you've been working on for a long time, suddenly destroyed in an instant. Some of you like working on those thousand piece puzzles and you, you, you have it all laid out on your dining room table or somewhere else in the house. Uh, imagine you're, you're about to put in the final few pieces of your thousand piece puzzle. And imagine someone comes in, dashes it all off the table. Your work undone in pieces. Well, that's what Jesus has done to the devil through what he accomplished at his cross and his empty tomb. He's undone it. He's untied it. He's destroyed it. The devil's life's work was to use our sin against us, to keep us captive, to doom us to death. Jesus has undone it. Satan can't use our sin against us anymore. I've shared this summary with you before. I've heard various preachers use it. I think it's very helpful. By Jesus' atoning work on the cross, we have been saved from sin's penalty, death. We are now being saved from sin's power. And we will one day be saved from sin's presence. We have already been saved from sin's penalty, death. We cannot die. We, we may die physically if Jesus doesn't return first. But we will not die spiritually. We will never be cut off from God in hell forever for our sin. So we're saved from sin's penalty. We, we, we also will be saved from sin's presence. Someday it just won't exist anymore. We won't, we won't have to worry about it, think about it ever again. And we are being saved from sin's power, which we'll think more about shortly. Because all because, friends, Jesus has undone the devil's work. And this is the beating heart of our faith. This is what we need to come back to time and time again as believers. 
Here is the A bookend upon which the Christian life is made possible. That the first appearance of Jesus was to destroy the devil's work. The devil is a defeated foe. He, he, even if he's still staggering, staggering around in the ring, the knockout blow has already been landed on him at Calvary. As Paul said to the Corinthians, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? This is the heart of our faith. This is the good news of Resurrection Sunday, the Lord's Day. Jesus Christ is the undefeated spiritual heavyweight champion of the world. He has destroyed the devil's work. That being the case, there are some very important implications for us. And that's what John explores in the rest of this, cha- of this chapter. So we've thought about the fact that the Son of God uh, appeared to destroy the devil's work. So we want to think secondly about the fact that the Son of God, by what he has done, the Son of God defines the children of God and the children of the devil. The Son of God defines the children of God and the children of the devil. There is this common superstitious notion in some places today that we're all children of God. And that's actually been encouraged by some churches who will christen, and that's what they call it. They don't call it baptism. They will christen all children, regardless of whether their parents claim faith in Christ. And it's helped things like that have led to this notion today in countries like ours. Aren't we all good people and all going to heaven and all God's children? Well, friends, John obliterates that attitude here in chapter 3. And we've seen that this is not because he's a cold-hearted, cranky old man. He, he writes with such affection in his letter. But he writes the truth. And his message is clear. There are two types of people in this world. Two families. There are the children of God. And there are the children of the devil. And which of those two groups you fall into depends on whether or not your life is leaning on that first bookend. The first appearance and work of the Son of God on the cross. What do you think about that? Whether or not you you have based your life on that and believe that that defines who you are and if we're left wondering who we are today uh, john in his text here gives us three tests he talks here about children of god and children of the devil so that we can be in no doubt about which we are and so three tests here uh, to see who the children of god and the children of the devil are the first test uh, children of the devil keep on sinning Children of the devil keep on sinning. Again, verse 8 is the key. Look at verse 8. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. That being the case, anyone living by faith in Christ, believing in the work of Christ, will not keep on doing the sins that the devil wants us to do. When we sin, we do the devil's bidding. And so the person who's trusting in Christ won't keep doing the devil's bidding. And if they do, John says, that's proof that they have not been set free from their slavery to sin and Satan. Look what John says again in verse 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Look also at verse 9, very similar language. No one born of God, we'll come back to that. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Friends, to keep on sinning, to live with sin calling the shots in your life, is proof that you're not a child of God. Instead, you're, you're still a child, a slave, in fact, of the devil. Even though you don't need to be because of what Jesus has done, If you're not trusting in him, not following him, not repenting, then you are still in slavery. Imagine Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt. God has sent all ten plagues. He's told his people and Pharaoh that he is setting his people free. And as the Israelites walk out of Egypt, Moses passes by an Israelite man and his family, still in their little hut, still in Egypt. And the Israelite man is walking around, hunched over, stooping down to gather up straw to make Pharaoh's bricks. 
And Moses says, brother, don't you know what's happened? God's delivered us. He's, he's set us free. You're, you're not a slave to Pharaoh any longer. He's not your master anymore. But the Israelite man keeps on gathering straw. He just doesn't believe it. If he believed it, he would stop gathering straw. And he would turn around and walk across the border with the Israelites. But because he doesn't, he remains a slave of Pharaoh. And that's what John is describing here spiritually. Someone who keeps on sinning because their life isn't leaning on and impacted by the first appearance of Jesus Christ. And that being the case, whether they realize it or not, admit it or not, sin and Satan are their masters. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Now we need to address something very important here. Maybe it's in your minds already. Is John saying that true Christians will never sin? Just look at verse 6. No one who abides in him, that's Jesus, keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. And so is John saying that Christians are perfect people, that if, if we're really God's children, we'll never sin again? Well, we have, to balance that. we have to balance what John says here with what he says earlier in his letter. Listen to what he said back in chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So whatever John means here in chapter 3, he cannot mean that Christians never sin. He's just said, if we say we have no sin... We're not telling the truth. So what's the key to this? Well, I think the key to it lies in chapter 3, verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning. Notice the present tense there. Everyone who makes a practice keeps on day by day. Someone who is in the habit of willingly, consciously, and without any sense of shame or guilt or remorse, they're sinning. Uh, Similarly, verse 6, he says, no one who keeps on sinning again present tense so for example the person who has been taking god's name in vain if that person is a true believer and and, and that sin is pointed out to them they don't just keep on doing it without caring about it the true believer will take that to god in prayer they'll confess that they will want to be rid of that by the help of the holy spirit the husband or wife who has a bad temper And their spouse comes to them respectfully and humbly to talk about it and ask them to deal with it. If if the spouse is a Christian, they'll confess it. They might be heartbreaking over it. They, They will not just keep on doing it without caring, without wanting to change and asking for God's help. Many, many other examples we could use. But John says, no one who keeps on sinning habitually, routinely, unashamedly has either seen Christ or known Christ. And friends, this also explains why some people in the world today do what they do, believe what they believe. Some of you have said to me before, how can people believe that abortion is okay? How can, how can a doctor do that? Or how can anyone believe that that's all right? Or any other number of things that, that we see being celebrated and promoted in our world. Well, ultimately, friends, it's for the reason John gives there in verse 6, they have neither seen nor known the love of God for us in Christ Jesus. Their lives aren't yet defined by the first appearance of Jesus Christ. It's their nature to sin and to keep on sinning, and so they do. But this is deeply searching for each one of us here today. Are there sins that we just keep on committing? Are there sins that we are making excuses for rather than repenting of? Lust in our thoughts or via our screens? Impatience with the driver in front or with our nearest and dearest? Greed, looking after ourselves instead of putting others first? We've seen that even in uh, the panic buying and so forth these last few weeks. Harsh, overcritical, rude, crude words. Do we make excuses Or do we make confession to the God who has sent the Son to destroy the the devil's power and sin's power? 
Some sins can be addictive, aggressive in our lives. They, they don't give up without a fight, but are we at least fighting? The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verse 19, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. And so yes, our old nature still clings on to us as Christians, but we're not okay with it. We're fighting it, aren't we? If we're not, if we're comfortable with sin, if we're making excuses, whose child are we? Children of the devil keep on sinning. That's the first test. But second test that John gives us here, that children of God have been inwardly changed. Children of God have been inwardly changed. Paul also said in Romans, he said, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. And that's very important. Paul says there's still sin in him, but it's not who he is. It clings to him. Sometimes it even gets the better of him, but he is not a sinner by nature anymore. Did you know that nowhere, as far as I'm aware, I'm open to being corrected on this, but nowhere that I'm aware of in the New Testament are Christians ever referred to as sinners. Nowhere. Now, there are certainly plenty of places where we're told that Christians do sin, as John has said in his letter, chapter 1, verse 8. But we're never described, our identity is never described as sinners. If you're a Christian, sinner is who you were by nature, when you were conceived, as David says in Psalm 51. You have a nature that is sinful from birth. Our natural tendency and direction is sin. But if your life has been propped up, resurrected on the bookend of Jesus Christ's first appearance, if you believe in him, a transformation has taken place. You are not who and what you used to be. You're no longer of the devil. You're a child of God. Look at verse 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. How? Why? Why? For God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. He has been born of God, born again. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, 3. He said we all need to be born of water. That was a way of referring to natural birth in Jesus' day, physical birth. And he says we also need to be born of the Spirit. And that's what John means here when he says God's seed abides in him. It's, it's a strange phrase. It's actually quite graphic in the original. But I think we can safely take it as a reference to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who regenerates us, who, who births us spiritually and who then stays with us forever. And he's the reason, friends, that the children of God cannot just keep on carelessly, carefree sinning. Once their sin is pointed out to them. Just notice how strongly John puts it at the end of verse 9. He says, he cannot keep on sinning. He cannot. And again, friends, that's deeply searching. Is that our attitude when tempted to sin or to celebrate sin? That we cannot do it. Remember Joseph's words when Potiphar's wife wanted him to go to bed with her. How can I do this thing and sin against God? Not just against Potiphar or Potiphar's wife or himself, but against God. Because all sin ultimately is sin against God. The true believer has been inwardly changed. We have the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Sin may sometimes get the better of us, but we're not okay with it when it does. We're at war with our sin. We hate our sin. And by God's help, increasingly, we do get rid of our sin. Children of God have been inwardly changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the third statement that John makes, or the third test that he gives for us, children of God visibly obey. Children of God visibly obey. Being born again of the Holy Spirit is, of course, a, a spiritual, invisible thing. 
Uh, for most of us, it's not a lightning bolt moment that it happens in our souls. It doesn't necessarily immediately show itself on the outside. But friends, inevitably and increasingly, it will. It will. It will be obvious who God's children are. Look at verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Look at verse 10. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Practicing righteousness, this is the evidence, this is the outward visible fruit of being a child of God. And again, John is writing in the present tense, practicing righteousness as opposed to practicing sin. And it's interesting, he says in verse 10, practicing righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. John there is summing up love, he's summing up the Christian life, love for God and, and love for brother, just as Jesus did in Matthew chapter 22. And this is the outward visible evidence, friends, of the inward change in our lives. And notice the order, the, the invisible, the work of the Spirit produces then the righteousness, the good deeds, the, the changed life. One writer says, John insists that it is those who are actually doing what is right, not simply those who make claims who are righteous. It's not necessarily people who say nice things and look like nice people and go to churches full of equally nice people who are children of God. It's those who obey God's word, who obey it regarding sexuality or generosity or idolatry, work ethic, speech, love for our neighbour. And how important it is, friends, in the time and place in which we live at the moment that we show our love for our neighbours. So here are these three tests. Children of the devil keep on sinning. Children of God have been inwardly changed and children of God visibly obey. And let me ask you the big question that comes out of all of this today. Are you practicing righteousness? Is there visible progress in your Christian living? Does your identity as a child of God, does it show itself in how you live? Where in your Christian life are you stronger by God's grace than you were last year? What sin used to master you, which, uh, which now you have a grip of by the power of the Holy Spirit? What could you, what could you just not, what would make you Broken hearted to even think of doing it or saying it anymore that used to just do it and not care. Some of you, these questions may bother you and worry you. Some of you have told me, you know, you've said to me, I, I look at my life and, and sometimes wonder if I really became a Christian. Because I see some things that are still not the way they should be and not happy with them and wish they weren't there. And I want to reassure you today, if, if you have those worries and thoughts, that sounds far more like a child of God to me than a child of the devil. That sounds like a child who wants to please his, his or her father more and more, not less and less. And for your encouragement, just as we close, notice again that verse 9 says, God's seed abides in us. God's seed Tim Keller, Tim Keller rightly points out, it's a seed, not a tidal wave. For most Christians, most of the time, God's Spirit doesn't sweep into our lives like a tidal wave that transforms the landscape in a split second. No, God's Spirit is like a seed. What does a seed do? A seed bears fruit in due time. Hannah and I have been laughing during the pregnancy. You get these websites that uh, tell you how big your unborn baby is each week of the pregnancy. And it says, this week your baby is the size of a banana or the size of a melon or whatever it is. But you know, there was a time when our baby was the size of a poppy seed. Isn't that incredible that we, we start life microscop microscopically small, barely a dot on the end of your finger. 
And look how much we grow before we were even born. Friends, the Holy Spirit is in us now and always. And perhaps he began his work in seed form, but over time it bears fruit. The Holy Spirit with us is evidence that we are children of God. And he will bear more and more fruit in our lives over time. And so be patient, be be prayerful, be confessing sin. And in your season, as the psalmist says, your life will bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit's seed. Jesus Christ appeared to destroy the works of the devil. He will come again to take us all into a glorious new existence. Are those the two bookends upon which your life is upright? Do you just keep on sinning? Or is your life increasingly marked by righteousness, powered by the Holy Spirit? It's one or the other, friends, child of the devil or child of God. By God's grace, may it be the latter for each of us. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the new identity that you give to those who were once dead in sin. We thank you, Lord God, that it is possible for us as your children to be, to be made upright, to be given life by the first and second appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his first appearance, accomplishing all the work for us to be saved and renewed and regenerated and adopted And sanctified and ultimately someday glorified. We thank you for his second appearance still to come. That moment when we know we will be made perfect. Father you know that if any of us were to say that we had no sin. We would be lying and the truth would not be in us. But Father we pray that for those of us who are your children. It would be increasingly the case that we are uh, we are dead to sin. We are dying. Our, our sins are dying off moment by moment, day by day. And that increasingly we're seeing the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Father, we pray that if there are any who have listened to this, who are listening to this, who are still children of the devil, even though they would recoil at the thought, Lord, show them today how they can become children of God by leaning their lives upon the person and work of Jesus Christ. Father, bless your word to our hearts today and help us to live in light of it, to love God and to love our brother, to love our neighbours, Lord, in these difficult days, uh, that we might bring glory to you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And now receive God's blessing, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all God's people this day and always. Amen.